Hello, everyone, and welcome to The Vertical Space, a podcast at the intersection of technology and flight. We are your hosts, Jim Barry and Luka Tomjanovic, and here we look at the most important forces shaping the market of advanced air mobility, with a particular focus on why and how they matter to those building a business in this very exciting and growing industry. When we first talk to applicants, we encourage them to bring three things to the table. One is a credible, certifiable design. Two is a customer that has gravitas. So enterprise level, societal benefit. And three is be willing to find those champions with an FAA that understand that you've got a credible product and a societal benefit to be had from it. Welcome back to the vertical space. Our guest today is Charlton Evans founder and CEO of End State Solutions, a firm focused on certification and their worthiness for drones and other forms of advanced air mobility. I have to say also that Charlton gets extra points for being a Harrier pilot in the Marine Corps earlier in his life. Given some of the recent milestones and rumors about drone regulations in the United States, we thought you would appreciate a discussion on the hot topics in FAA drone regulations from a true subject matter expert whose firm recently helped Matternet receive the industry's first drone type certification. We covered a lot of ground with Charlton, starting with the first unmanned aircraft type certifications in the restricted category back in 2013, and ways in which those operations failed to properly address the needs of the oil and gas industry at the time. We then followed regulatory and industry milestones to present day, discovering along the way the remaining challenges and opportunities facing the drone industry. Charlton assigns responsibility to both the FAA and the industry for the state of commercial drone adoption among enterprises. Since 2013, there have been fewer champions within the FAA doing the heavy lift to tackle advanced air mobility and drive integration of drones into the national airspace system, resulting in a natural bureaucratic filter to innovation at the FAA. At the same time, the industry is still notorious for not coming to the table with fully developed products and concepts of operations. This gap between rigorous safety-centric FAA processes and the spirit of rapid innovation borrowed from the tech world still exists, but is definitely closing as both the industry and regulators gain more experience from ongoing projects and initial operations. There's a ton of insights from this deep dive with Charlton, but let me just highlight a few. You'll hear what Charlton means by any change is a change, or there's no certification by obvious, how the FAA needs to get more comfortable with an appropriate assessment of risk, what three things type certification applicants need to bring to the table, how appropriate the durability and reliability type certification process really is, the black hole of 2117B certification, in what ways drones and light sport aircraft are similar, opportunities for innovation, and of course, advice for entrepreneurs. As mentioned, Charlton Evans is the founder and chief executive officer of End State Solutions, a firm focused on certification and airworthiness for AAM, drone delivery, HAPS, and RPAS. Charlton was a Harrier pilot and tactical air controller in the Marine Corps and still flies for business and pleasure as a commercial pilot. Charlton has led several successful civil and military drone certifications, as well as historic BV loss flight operations. Recently, End State Solutions assisted with the FAA type certification of the Matternet M2 delivery drone. Charlton also led historic linear infrastructure and disaster response flights with the type certified Scan Eagle UAS that resulted in the induction of Scan Eagle November 202 Sierra Echo into the Smithsonian Institute in 2016. Today, End State Solutions is considered a trusted advisor by both industry and FAA, engaged across the spectrum of type production, operational approvals, as well as regulatory affairs, building relationships that build trust and products that are trusted through certification. We hope you'll enjoy the conversation as much as we did. Thank you, Charlton, for being our guest. This episode of the Vertical Space Podcast is brought to you by UAvionics. UAvionics is the leader in low size, weight and power certified avionics for manned, unmanned and advanced air mobility aircraft. Let UAvionics help you achieve your goals, whether that be type certification, airspace access or beyond visual line of sight operations. UAvionics has certified and certifiable communications, navigation and surveillance avionics for your aircraft. So head over to uavionics.com or Google it to see how you can start flying safer and move your platform forward into shared airspace.
Carlton, welcome to the Vertical Space. Thank you for joining us for an exciting conversation on drone markets and regulations. Thank you. I'm really glad to be here. Appreciate the opportunity. So let's start with, is there anything that very few in the industry agree with you on? <laughs> yeah, there are, are, are some things. You know, the, the applicants we work with in general are from the emerging technology world, right? So they're uh, dynamic, they're agile, they want to often fail quickly to get to the right answer. And that's sort of antithem us to uh, certification, right? Be it design or operational. So I think when we face applicants, oftentimes part of the process that we want to make them more familiar with is that you really need to lock down your design. You really need to understand why the FA starts where it does. The FA has some valid reasons for their starting points. And ultimately what this means is recognizing that there are reasons behind the rules, just not just blindly challenging them, but understanding that each rule is trying to address a hazard or reduce reduce risk in some way. You know, some sometimes it's been said that the rules are written in blood. Some of them, many of them are, some are less uh, dramatic, but the bottom line is that there's a reason behind each one. So that concept of understanding what's behind the rule before you challenge it or uh, try to propose a, a different approach is really important and sometimes not well understood in the industry. We hear that quite often and, and agree with it as well. And I can't help but wonder, given the activity, how come this lesson has not been learned already? I think it's cultural. I think the, the FA is ensconced in, we have a rule and the emerging technology world is ensconced in, uh, we are moving fast and we have a great idea here and they're very confident that it's, it's going to work. And there's just that gap between, which is, this is evolution. This is, this is emerging. This is exciting. And we promise it works. And the FA is on the other side saying, show me how, show me why. And here's the rules that we currently have that do that. So there's got to be a meeting in the middle. So culturally, there's just a miss there. That's my take on it. So mm -hmm. if you were to sit back and say there would be three things that you would want industry to be aware of as it relates to why the rules exist that you think are most misunderstood, what would they be? The ability to make changes in a rapid way. And, and the fact that a change is a change. Any change is a change. So the concept of evolving a product during certification is a bit of a misnomer. There are going to be changes. We're going to learn things about the product along the way. We're going to learn things about operations along the way, and we need to address those. But those those changes should be forced by learning, not driven by a desire to improve the product along the way. Does that does that answer the question, Jim? I think so. Give me an example, Charlton, if you could. Well, the gross examples or the bigger examples are outer mold line changes on design, right? If you if you change the outer mold line of a of a system, uh, any given aerospace product, it by definition changes its aerodynamics, changes performance, changes, changes, changes. So that's that's the big one. If you change the outer mold line, you're really talking about a different aircraft. Other changes that are less obvious and more maybe more prevalent, you've got software changes that need to occur and should occur. However, comma, there is a minimal level of software that works. And when that software fulfills the basic function that the aircraft is designed to perform, then that's where we need to start and stay until it gets certified and then move into changes. So this is part of the pick the battles conversation that we'll probably talk about later, where look, we've got something that works, we're confident it works, we can demonstrate that it works. If we wanna change that just to improve it, then that change should be likely pushed to post certification. How do you see this gap closing over time? And by gap, I mean the, the culture gap that you're describing between the aviation world and the technology world. Well, projects always force that. And, and that's what the integration pilot program did is it created these projects that forced both the FAA and industry to solve these problems in a collaborative way. And that's happened. When the um, integration pilot programs first came out, I sort of scoffed at them. I thought that maybe they were just science projects and another you know, one-off demo opportunity that maybe wouldn't move the needle. But what it really became was this proving ground where the products were put against operations and forced the FAA to answer, how do we get this done on type certification, production certification, and operational approvals? All that was suddenly 
had to be solved if any of these projects were going to make progress. On the flip side, the industry had to understand, had to begin that journey of understanding, okay, these are the rules we're up against. How do we navigate them to either fit within them or find an alternative means of complying with them that creates that equivalent level of safety? And we'll come back to the IPP and, and beyond a little bit later, but let's start with a uh, with a high level analysis of your your assessment of the current state of the commercial drone market especially as it relates to enterprise adoption and the maturity of the technology well there's probably more progress than i think people give the industry credit for right now or give the faa credit for for that matter you know, we're i think everyone's fairly aware of the uh, the matternet type certification process that came to completion and they were granted a type certificate on the m2 that's the most recent civil and and first standard type certificate to be issued. We were involved with that. And we we're very proud of that process and, and helping them get through that. However, near a decade ago, you know, in 2013, there were two type certificates granted in the restricted category. So what happened between then and now? And the answer is kind of not enough or, you know, maybe not a lot isn't the right characterization, but certainly not enough progress to satisfy both industry and frankly, the FA on where we are kind of restarting today. So the current state of the industry is we've hit a milestone in that type certification process. We're now pushing forward and they've been pushing forward through the operational approvals. That's maturing as well. I think everybody understands that neither approval or neither certification is completely the right answer, right? The Durability and reliability means of compliance that was used for the TC was a great start, but it had its fits and starts along the way, had some flaws in it that I think there'll be lesson learned about. And I think universally, everybody understands that operating a Matterdat M2 drone under a Part 135 is a bit overkill on the operational side as well. But we just don't have a different answer currently. So we're at this inflection point where the industry has started to meet the standards in meaningful ways. And the FAA is now assessing, okay, we got this done. There's some 135s in place. There are There is ATC with more to follow. However, comma, how do we go back and learn from those certifications to figure out what is a more appropriate path? Where is less okay along the way? What were the, uh, the two certifications that you referenced in 2013? So the uh, the Scan Eagle, in situ Scan Eagle, was granted a type certificate under restricted category, and so was the Air Environment Puma. They were similar use cases. Um, in the case of the Scan Eagle, ConocoPhillips employed the Scan Eagle to work offshore off the northern slope of Alaska, and the Puma was engaged again by oil and gas in Alaska to survey um, oil fields onshore there. Both were beyond visual line of sight operations. Both were the first of their kind in terms of having a type certificate that supported Part 91 operations, BV loss, and purely commercial in nature. There was not restricted airspace. There was not, there were not visual observers. They just got the TCs, which gave them the design approval necessary to go operate commercially. And then we were granted waivers to go fly. So that was a pretty big deal back in the day. <laughs> right. So given that milestone 10 years ago, are you surprised that we're not seeing more of those kinds of platforms out and doing uh, real commercial use cases? A little bit. I think um, a number of factors have come into play that didn't result in the, kind of this explosion of that work. The regulatory landscape from the oil and gas industry changed significantly. We also applied the Scan Eagle to work over rail down in the lower 48 via BNSF. So there was a Pathfinder effort that occurred there. I think in both cases though, and I, I can't speak to the Puma, but I'll speak to the Scan Eagle operations, is that the industry side had a hard time meeting two requirements for the customer. One was the adoption of payloads that actually collected the data they need. And the other was cost. The uncrewed, unmanned <laughs> autonomous systems are anything but crewless, right? There's a fairly significant contingent of folks on the ground that are necessary in those systems to make that work. So the cost was a factor. And I think that's 
going to change as things scale. But when a defense contracting company gets into this business and tries to apply their models commercially, what we often find is that the, the cost model that comes from the DOD world is just not survivable in the commercial. Charlton, is it possible that the market just wasn't that attractive? I mean, at the end of the day, anytime you don't have a whole lot of competitors in a market, it could be for a couple of different reasons. But is it possible there just wasn't attractive enough to pull in other competitors? Yeah, I think we saw some competitiveness emerge from those opportunities or those uh, projects, uh, particularly in the wildland firefighting world, where uh, those same platforms were then applied to wildland fire data collection, uh, as well as uh, other natural disaster data collection. The the mitigations were in place naturally in wildland fire because there was always a temporary flight restriction involved with the fire. So that gave an opportunity for beyond visual line of sight under sterile airspace, if you will. So that mitigated the risk of midair collision. And as a result, now we had a playground to go collect data and push data in a very new way for the wildland firefighting world. But again, I think the cost and the data collect, data provisions were not palatable to that industry. We discussed this a little bit offline, but certainly it appears that what is dictating the pace of the market is both regulatory sort of friction, uh, but also lack of maturity in the industry as well. So can you unpack this a little bit more and how you see both of those? Yeah. Yeah. So um, the regulator definitely is and needs to further evolve. There's a shift from the 2013 timeframe to now in that there's been a hiatus because there have been fewer champions within the FAA for this type of work, be it the smalls, what I'll call the tweeners or 55 to maybe 1300 pounds, um, and then advanced air mobility and high altitude pseudo satellite. All of that work is new and novel in some way, shape or form. So that takes within the FAA champions to overcome the friction that exists in getting new and novel work through a bureaucratic organization like the FAA. Charlton, you mean people within the FAA who were champions? Who were they? Name a couple that were who stood out. Well, I'll, I'll name uh, Jim Williams, who at the time ran the, the UAS office. And he was instrumental, I think, in coordinating uh, across lines of business within the FAA to push the opportunities that industry was presenting in meaningful ways. And folks within his office as well that ended up herding the cats within the FAA, for lack of a better term, to put them on the panels, to put them on the projects and to force conclusions that would have been very difficult to do. And so there, there were change agents within the FAA at the time, uh, whether they were aware of that or not, that were pushing an agenda of getting projects through to completion. A little bit of a hiatus there, and now that's that's coming back. I think, um, you know, currently, Lirio Lu is demonstrating that kind of desire to really progress the industry along and collaborate in ways that are more aggressive. So I'm, I'm hopeful that that's coming back. I see it in different segments. There are also folks within AUS that I think are you know willing to be that bull in the china shop and and just get things done outside of typical bureaucratic means or methodology. So that's that's part of the FA side. The industry side is certainly faces its own challenge. I mentioned the um, desire to make changes along the way, right? Any change is a change. So <laughs> big or small, uh, it stands the chance of not only creating friction within a certification, but also just at on the face of it. So if you want to make a software change, you got to discuss that and 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 find a, a means to make that change within a conformed article. But not only that, that change in software is likely to have a ripple effect through all the documentation that surrounds all the artifacts that surround a certification. So if you change the way the, the system operates, then that's got to be reflected in the way it's operated according to what the remote pilot sees in his manual. It's got to be reflected in the way it's maintained. So the maintenance manual has to be changed. All those changes have to be reviewed by different entities. If you change outer mold line of propulsion, that changes the noise that the system might make. So there's a whole different set of reassessment that could have to occur. So again, stability in design is critical to an efficient certification process. How much do you think the certification process itself is responsible for the change phenomena? Because in a way, you know, if it takes four or five years to get through type cert, by the time you receive it, your technology is ready for a replacement anyway. Right. And parts obsolescence is is a big deal, uh, particularly among the smaller UAS. 
and and that's a real thing that, and that's why some of the changes along the way with all the ipps have been permitted without restarting the program because there are just practicalities to obsolescence that had to be addressed. Mm -hmm. So there was accommodation made by the FAA for that. And and in fact, the FAA was very accommodating when uh, it was discovered that there were elements of the design that needed to be changed or improved, but through similarity were demonstrated to be close enough to the original design to not have to restart the certification. So as far as I know, nobody had to go back to zero on flying their DNR hours. Mm -hmm. Um, You mentioned lack of leadership as one of the contributing factors. What else is causing the both drone type certifications as well as operational approvals to be such a painful and slow process, at least in the U.S.? Well, it's rigorous, right? And it's meant to be rigorous. And rigorous can mean slower. So I think, you know, uh, let's talk about the industry factor. The industry is infamous for not coming to the table with a fully developed product and a fully developed concept of operations. So I'm a big promoter of having a very detailed and very well vetted concept of operations. It's a deliverable to the FAA with many of these programs, and it's a deliverable because there doesn't exist a rule set completely captures the operation, right? If you want to buy a part 23 airplane and go fly under 91 and 135, that's all known. That is your CONOP. Your CONOP is defined by those rule sets. If you want to do something under part 21 that that is somewhere between 107 and 91, or you get pushed into 91, but there, there are many exemptions that are needed. And 21 is by definition, a Chinese menu that will likely require exemptions as well. The result is you've got to define that concept of operations. So the better thought out that is, and the more thorough it is, and the more locked down the design is, if you can put the concept of operations together with a a solid design, you can probably, well, for you can certainly uh, reduce the amount of time you're going to spend in certification. So that's from the, the industry perspective. On the FAA side, there's a natural bureaucratic filter that occurs. So there are probably, I don't know, of the very small percentage of FAA personnel that are assigned to UAS, probably 30% of them are very forward-leading, very innovative, very motivated. The rest are are thrown in there and have to learn to be innovative, forward-leaning, and aggressive about getting a new and novel product through the process. So it's incumbent on those leaders to oversee that and make sure that change that has to occur doesn't actually become by nature a filter, if you will, on the process. Charlton, I was talking to a former FAA executive recently, and they were saying, not specifically talking about drones, but we were talking about advanced air mobility. And they said, listen, when there is a compelling use case, it has a huge influence on the FAA. If they feel yep. it's going to improve the economy, if they think that's you know it's going to make a big change, yep. it will really stimulate the FAA to get something done because they want to do what's right. Obviously, but they want to do what's safe first. Is it possible that the drone use case is just not compelling enough to get on the top 10 list of the administrator throughout the last... I mean, is it possible it was in the top 10 list in the days of Michael Huerta and it's not today? Yeah, I think societal benefits certainly has a play. And when we first talk to applicants, we encourage them to bring three things to the table. One is credible, certifiable design. Two is a customer that has gravitas. So enterprise level, societal benefit, big customers. And three is be willing to find those champions with an FAA that understand that you've got a credible product and a societal benefit to be had from it. So yes, I think that is true. And I don't think it's been at the FAA's leadership list of things to pursue in the past few years. I I agree with that sentiment. What do you think is the way to create the sense of urgency at the FAA? Well, I think it's happening through projects. And the longer the projects play out, the more vocal industry becomes because there's a whole lot of money behind getting these projects over the finish line. And the longer the projects are in play, the more money is spent. It's just unavoidable. So we've seen the advanced air mobility world see just a tremendous amount of investment. Those investors expect a return on their investment and they're getting more and more vocal about how long is this going to take. And there may be some displaced expectations there. I think often uh, investors who aren't very familiar with aerospace may have overly aggressive expectations on what their return on investment might be over time. But ultimately, 
the the ground truth is that the squeaky wheels are going to get the grease. You mentioned earlier that industry is often coming in front of the FAA with a half-baked product or a half-baked conops. The common sort of comment that that I'm certainly hearing from the industry is that on the one hand, the FAA does say that you have to mitigate risks and you have to have a comprehensive solution, both on the aircraft, associated elements, con ops, et cetera, et cetera. But at the same time, there is no clear guidance on how applicants can actually meet FAA requirements and what those requirements are and what the process looks like and how the different agencies and departments within the FAA then coordinate this process. That seems to be still very much a black box. Given the maturity of the industry, given the flooding of the FAA with documentation and exemptions and waivers and applications of all sorts, why do you think that we're still in in the spot where we are now? Yeah, I think the, the truth is somewhere in between. Certainly, we have seen many examples of artifacts required for certification that are not based in aerospace best practice or meet a given standard. Examples include drawing packages, so a detailed drawing package that actually accounts for every bit and part on the the airframe and, oh, by the way, covers the GCS and and whatever other associated elements are are included or not included. We've seen manuals that are really engineering documents rather than a document that's written from a pilot's perspective to, to operate or an operator's perspective to operate the system. And we've seen maintenance manuals that are very much the same way where the manual is really a design description from an engineering perspective rather than an instructional manual that tells a maintainer who may be the recipient of this product, not part of the manufacturing, how to maintain that product. So those are three examples of where the industry typically has not had a good perspective on, you know, again, aerospace best practice or aerospace standards. The, the flip side is that those same manuals, because often they are not what the FAA expects to see, gets a very rigorous look from the FAA. And what you end up with is a, a manual that's far, far overbuilt for the purpose because it's an additive process. The, the FAA is going to be reluctant to tell an applicant to take anything out of the manual because, well, apparently it's important to the, the applicant that whatever's in there is in there, but they're going to ask you to clarify, to add, to address many issues within that manual that they see as gaps. So you end up with a kind of a monstrosity of a manual, a 737 type manual for a small UAS, which really isn't necessary, but it's that, that meeting in the middle that, that has to happen. Right. And so I guess we can agree that there is no clear guidance from the FAA on how these applicants can meet all of the FAA requirements. That's absolutely true. There is emerging guidance, but it is still part of the process to work through these projects and come out the other side with lessons learned that become guidance. And that just takes a so, long, long time. So the question that comes up then is, I mean, clearly there is a process that the FAA uses to approve or assess the exemptions and waivers. Is that not a good enough process? Why not make that more you know, public, more transparent? Yeah, well, this, this, uh, the General Accounting Office asked the same question, right? And we recently seen uh, the, that, an assessment of that very question in the, the report out from the GAO. There isn't an enterprise coordinated strategy that links all those requirements together. When you apply for certification, you've got to get buy-in from a number of agencies and offices within the FAA. AIR is is on the design side, AFS, the operational side. And ultimately, when those two things are resolved, you've still got to go to air traffic to ensure that you've got the waivers and exemptions necessary for entry into service from an air traffic perspective. And oh, by the way, there's AGC and uh, the legal entities and the environmental AEE along the way. So those offices are not coordinated in a way that brings them together in facing the applicant in a, what should I call it? Probably a, it's not very elegant. It's not a well-coordinated strategic enterprise way. It's, it's, you've got to go fight these battles often individually with these different offices. So that's something that the UAS office is chartered with tackling, and they've been struggling with that for a decade or more. 
maybe longer. We've seen it under the IPP program where once the certifications were well underway, AIR had a lot of momentum in getting the TCs through the process. It took a long time for AFS to come to the table. And when they did, boy, there was a pretty huge (laughs) number of wrenches that were tossed into the process based on their perspective on what it should look like. Can you unpack this a little bit? This is the associate elements discussion, correct? Or something else? Yeah, no, associated elements is probably the biggest wrench that was thrown in along the way. Um, and, and I will propose that many of the issues that associated elements, that concept of associated elements was proposed to solve were actually already solved within the, the rules. And there were proponents within the industry side that weren't satisfied with how the rules solve for example, maintenance on parts outside of the aircraft. So most of these systems have ground control stations and the ground control station can look like anything from an iPhone to a full up trailer with filled with computers and keyboards and a, a place and monitors for somebody to sit and, and observe and control the aircraft. So there's a vast array of variability in what that looks like. If your ground control station is an iPhone, it's going to be difficult to control that under a traditional FAA design certification process. It's not impossible, but it's just unusual. So there were proponents who were applicants under the IPP process and the DNR certification process that said, look, we don't think these should be in there. And we think this is separate. And we can give you an interface document that describes that you just got to have an iPhone. You don't need to know anything more about it than it's an iPhone. It's got this level of software. And then We don't want that certified under the TC because it's going to be difficult to document changes and it's going to be difficult to change the what kind of iPhone because you've got to revisit the TC. That's true. However, the alternative that was ultimately decided upon created this associated elements concept where that's outside of the TC, but now you got to go seek certification or approval for that from the operations side of the house. And our concern with that is that each local or regional FAA office is going to have to accept and approve whatever that system is proposing for its associated elements, which we're concerned dilutes the process and may actually make it harder to get approvals rather than control it. This this resulted in about a year and a half delay in the whole process. Is that How is this working out in practice? Well, there aren't a lot of cases where it's been put to the test. Matternet's TC obviously was granted and they're seeking operational approvals and amendments to the to the type certificate to, uh, as I mentioned before, catch up with some of those changes that would have made under the TC, but wanted to get the TC complete before proposing additional changes to the platform. So it's really yet to be witnessed how associated elements will be applied in the field in a meaningful way. So no player has gone and obtained operational approvals for uh, associated elements from the flight standards office? Not directly with the TC. They have been accepted under the 44807 processes that support the 135s. Speaking of 135s, I was looking also at the GAO report that you referenced, and I heard a statistics there that as of the, the time of the writing, which was, I think, September of 2022, the FAA received 48 requests for Part 135 air carrier certificates and only at the time issued four. Recently, we've had the fifth. Is this a similar approval rate that is observed in crewed aircraft? I don't know what the rates are for crewed aircraft, but I can say that there's a tremendous amount of frustration in getting 135s in the traditional uh, crewed aircraft world, for sure. And it was actually a pretty big topic at the last National Business Aviation Association meeting last year. I think it will probably be again this year. David Bolter from FAA coveted that he was going to attack that issue in flight standards and and try to get some of that unstuck because there do appear to be multiple log jams. It's a rigorous process. One of the interesting and a little silly examples that come up as a result of applying drone certification processes for part 135, because this is a framework that is very mature for crewed aircraft, drone companies are getting into these weird situations where they have to seek exemptions and waivers like the need to carry manuals on board. (laughs) Right. Right. And again, it's a simple, it should be a blanket exemption or a blanket waiver, but that's not how the system works. 
each petitioner in the case of an exemption has to apply or each applicant has to apply for a waiver and it has to be assessed one off and granted or denied. And that assessment process and the temporal nature of exemptions and waivers is why we just can't continue forever to build the business on exemptions and waivers. Charlton, let's say you're the FAA administrator. Two things. First, you're asked by the head of the DOT. So I'm getting pressure from a lot of investors. I'm getting pressure from a lot of companies that seem to have good use cases to speed up the approval and certification process for drones. Why should I? What's the real value that's coming from these companies that I, as the head of the DOT, should put more emphasis on to allow you as the head of the FAA to speed up the process? What would be your answer? There's definitely economic benefit. I mean, this is the future of aviation, if you will. Be more specific. So the levels of autonomy that are going to emerge from the work that's being done now are the same autonomous systems or autonomous concepts that are going to empower us to have safer aviation operations, commercial aviation operations across the board. So the level of risk in aviation operations is actually going to go down as this matures. The level of capacity within aviation to meet the economic needs of business is going to go up. Give me an example of how capacity is going to increase. Well, AAM is is an easy example because if we can actually enable those regional flow of people and goods in a far more efficient and far more higher capacity way, that enables the rest of the economy to build. It's like any other mode of transportation. If it's economical and it's efficient and it's it's got capacity, then it's going to, if it's built, they will come, if you will. That's my, mm-hmm. my concept here. You know, you look at rail, you look at our, our interstate highway systems, you look at our national airspace system, I think in, in many cases stretch to capacity. And that is what makes the case for we either build more of that out or we evolve into this other layer that enables economic growth. Yeah, we want to enable the, the vertical space, let's say. All right, so you can, let's say you convince she or he, and then they say to you, okay, you're the guy, you're in charge of the FAA, you've got to speed it up. You know, I'm getting pressure that EASA is doing it a lot better than we are. So what would be the things that you would do to speed up the certification and approval process? I would find leadership that was willing to die on that hill. I would find leadership that wasn't concerned about their career. As- With it, leadership within the FAA? Yes, Okay. Yes. And and I would assign that leadership to leading this, being a champion internal to the FA at the senior executive levels to ensure that it got the attention, the resources, and had the support of leadership so that the working levels feel like they can make decisions appropriate to their grade, to their place so in the food chain. Let's say you got the leader and the leader comes to you and says, boy, it seems like Yasa is doing this a lot better than we are. What would be the things that you would incorporate from Yasa? Well, uh, you know, there are these different striations where all the civil aviation authorities make progress in different ways. So, you know, if we break it up into, I think, generically the three or four segments, you've got the smalls, if you will, you know, the the below 400 foot crowd, uh, below 55 pounds, and then what I'll call the tweeners, uh, 55 to 13, 20, and maybe up and away, either below 400 feet or up and away up to the, the teens, if you will. The, the flight levels even. And then you've got that advanced mobility crowd, which is the 135 crowd trying to do del- either delivery of people or goods. And then you've got high altitude pseudo satellite work up above all that. We haven't really even broached the part 25, part 121 world, which is yet to come. But if you break it up into those striations, I would say enabling the smalls through appropriate assessment of risk. And that is something I think that's been really challenging for the FAA to do is accept there is risk in today's Part 23 operations, be they 23-based aircraft or or subsets of that, including LSA and experimental. Th- those operations are typically far riskier to people and property on the ground and in the air than any of these below 400-foot small UAS operations. And really setting a line in the sand or setting a bar that says, yes, we understand there's risk. This is the measured risk that we're willing to accept. This is the level of safety that the industry has to meet and it's appropriate. And we're gonna do this safely, but we're going to accept that a low risk product and a low risk CONOP is just that, and we're not gonna overdo it. So that would be the enablement of the smalls. In the, the tweeners, I would say that forcing industry to come up with solutions that meet similar 
products and similar operations to, again, part 23 and part 91 is not a stretch. And just in a more prescriptive way, laying out what those are. The reason I say prescriptive is, is that because right now, when one enters into a 2117B project with the FAA, you got to create that concept of operations that defines the, the system and the operation. And then you've got to work your way through an operational risk assessment and then a rule by rule analysis of what applies. And if it's a part 23 like airplane, you've got to work your way through all of part 23, part 91, part 61, assess each one of those rules, see if it's applicable, not applicable, or partially applicable. And then for the partials, you've got to create a, an equivalent level of safety language that actually allows you to meet it by an alternative means. So that process right there is a black hole. And that's what's holding up that that segment from a regulatory perspective. Now we can talk about the challenges with detect and avoid and other technology, but from a regulatory perspective, it's very cumbersome. Can we talk a little bit more about the appropriate or the equivalent level of safety? In what way is the FAA struggling with it right now? And you know, can you give us some examples? Yeah, let's use a concrete example and detect and avoid is the, the easy one. So today, a nominal pilot in given single engine part 23 airplane on a nominal VFR day can see some traffic that's local to him. He's got constraints in his ability to scan, his, his, the, his tasking in the, in the cockpit, heads down, heads up. He's got a structure around him that limits his view. And he certainly does not, or typically cannot see very well behind him at all. And the, the 91113 rule set addresses all that. It's right of way rules and it's levies a requirement on not only him in his cockpit, but the other pilot in the other cockpit to keep a, an eye out for other airplanes. It's kind of the last line of defense. And in VFR, under VFR uh, rules, it's kind of the only line of defense besides communication over the radio, et cetera. So let's take that example. And I would submit that pilots are not great at seeing other airplanes. Now, how we measure that, and there's been some studies, has not really been accepted. The FAA has not decided on how well do pilots see They've not published that bar, right? That's that level of safety that's missing. I think that should be published. I think part of the reason it hasn't been published is it's not a very good news story. But if that were published, then we'd have a level of safety to chase, at least a minimum bar for a system on board or, or ground-based for those tweener UAS, for example, between 55 and 1,320 pounds, between 400 feet and flight level 180 under VFR, I think almost... Any of the products that are at the leading edge of detect and avoid today, be they ground-based or on board, are going to beat that pilot any day of the week under day VFR circumstances, and in many cases, much better. So that discussion has not really come about. There's never, never been, to my knowledge, a point where the FAA said, this is how well your system has to quote unquote see to detect. And again, what do you think is the root cause for this? Is, is the FAA pointing to the industry and saying, hey, the, it's on you to, to demonstrate this and the data that you have thrown at us is not good enough? In some cases, but I think that narrative is a bit of an excuse because there have been many projects that have proposed multiple means and methodologies on board, ground-based, et cetera. And I think in many of those cases, they can be demonstrated to be better than that nominal pilot on a nominal day in a, in a nominal airplane. But because there's no standard, the FAA's default is to, well, it's got to be better, right? It's got to be, and my, my impression is what they're looking for is some, is almost like an F-35, like 360 degree awareness <laughs> at all times of everything in the airspace, regardless of its active, passive, et cetera. And that's just not achievable and it's not necessary. Right. So how does EASA going around solving this problem, have they defined those uh, equivalent levels of risk? My sense of that is that the, the SORA process is being used to address each ground and air risk case, case by case, which gets you incremental gains, I think, if one makes the argument along the way. But I'm also not aware, and, and I'm not as well versed in EASA as I am the FAA's current approach. I'm not aware that that level of safety, for example, for detect and avoid has been published as a standard to be met in Europe either. Right. So at this point, what are some of the major outstanding open items when it comes broadly to drone flight regulation, whether this is type certification or operational approvals? Well, we've gotten over that first hurdle of getting ATC across the board, across the finish line. We have not 
however, been able to darken the skies with Matterdead M2s. So getting through the amended type certification process is still at work. And then getting all elements of the FAA to accept that there's been a type certified platform and that type certification carries weight of a known quantified amount of reliability so that you can take that type certificate, that design approval and apply it across all operational use cases because you have a known quantity there that's produced this. We know what the design is and we know that it's produced the same way every time because it's got a production certificate. So we've got a known, we take that variable out of the equation and give it credit for being as reliable as we have measured it to be. And in this case, under the process that Matternet went through with the M2, they flew 540 hours. And in their G2, that says though they should be able to fly over population densities of at least 3,000 people per square mile. And then it becomes a question of how do you measure that? How do you make your safety case for what that population density looks like in a given operational scenario. This institutional reluctance to give the type cert enough significance and, and weight, do you think this is somehow related to the fact that the durability and reliability process is not very typical process that you would go and certify a traditional crewed aircraft? I don't know whether it's doubt about the process as much as as it is in a lack of understanding about the way the different major pieces of certification fit together. So the folks on the operational side of the FAA under AFS or ATO may just not have a good understanding of what it takes or what goes into certifying a design and getting a production certificate. So that lack of understanding can lead to a dismissal of the of the credibility of the, the process. What do you think about the DNR process as a way to type certified drones? I think it's actually a great idea. I think it was, uh, you know, had some fits and starts about how it was executed. And there's some learning points along the way. But ultimately, the, the advantages of it are that, hey, you, you took your thing, you said it was designed, you know, you define the design, that still occurs, you're not skipping any steps. And then you go show us how it works nominally over a period of time. And you also show us some likely failures, like an engine out or a uh, loss of calm, and some specific things that we, we might want to see. What are some abnormal operations that aren't necessarily emergencies, but how does the, the system or the pilot deal with off-nominal thing? And in so doing, we demonstrated, and we continue to demonstrate across all the applicants, that the systems are indeed safe. It's prescribed. We, we know what goes on when you operate it nominally. So that's the upside. And it's it should be far more efficient than it was. And I think in future it will be. I think there's really a path there to a, a timely certification of a product that is low risk. The flip side is that if you certify a product like that as a system, as a whole system, then the question is, well, how do I modify it post-certification? Because I modified it as a whole system. We didn't do subsystem certification. So how do we know if we make a change that we don't have to go back and refly effectively all that time to determine that that change doesn't have an impact on the intended function of the design. So what's the FAA's current thinking on it? Would companies need to go through the entire regime again? Uh, this kind of comes back to a major minor change and there's discretion given to the aircraft certification office on if the changes proposed require uh, various levels of demonstration. It can mm -hmm. be anything from none to yes, you've got to refly the whole thing. And two extreme examples are, well, we had we have found that we think this screw might come loose. So on all these screws, we're going to add Loctite. Okay, design accepted, change accepted, no further discussion required. And you notify the FAA and the FAA says, got it, Loctite, and we'll, we'll include that in the design. Minor change, no big deal. The flip side is, well, we really think we need two more motors and props on it. <laughs> Welcome back to recertification as a right. different design, right? What, what do we know about the recent rumors about the FAA potentially abandoning the DNR process? I think that was a result of a uh, rumor and innuendo or maybe some statements on behalf of folks who, again, one side of the house not understanding the other side of the house. So there is widespread frustration within the FAA themselves. They they recognize that, you know, that shouldn't have been a four-year process for Matternet. It should have been a, a one-year process on the outs. And on the 135 side, you know, UPS shouldn't have taken so long to get their 135. So there's this kind of understanding that this is very hard and there must be a better way. And there is probably 
better or different ways coming to address various use cases and con ops that may not require a TC. And I think in that discussion, that made it back to industry as you're not going to get a TC or you're not going to need one or DNR didn't work. That grew legs and, uh, you know, via the telephone game, I think, and I think it came out of probably the operational side through AFS, who may not have understood all the machinations that are going on to change the process, the different avenues going forward in the future that may not be DNR, but may give operational approvals in a different way through industry consensus standards. All these discussions are happening. And what fell out of that was somebody bit off on the soundbite that says DNR is going away or TCs are going away. That's just not the case. So the, the DNR process is alive and well, and you have confirmation for it. Yes. That's good to hear. What about... The new strategy for integrating UAS is supposed to be out by the end of March of this year after about a year of delay. What do we know about this document? Well, I am hopeful that what we will see is, again, a push towards, one, increasing the rate and the efficiency with which waivers and exemptions are granted. And that's and I, and I say that with some regret, if you will, because we really need to get away from waivers and exemptions. Everybody's known that for a long time. But until such time as there are different, better processes available for scaled certification, then the waivers and exemptions are going to keep the industry in a mode where they can create revenue. And that's critical. I'm hopeful there's pressure on that. And I think we're starting to see that. I think over this year, you're going to see a break in the logjam for exemptions and waivers in the near term. I am hopeful that we will also see the concept of an industry consensus standard-based way of approving designs in order to support operations that are also appropriate in their scope and scale of complexity. So let me take an example. Um, right now, today, you can go buy and or build a light sport air aircraft, and it can be built under the experimental category. It can be built under uh, or purchased whole as a uh, S or ELSA. SLSA, I guess, is the one that's that's purchased outright. But there are only a very few limited cases where you can go apply that same product to a commercial business case. So you can't stick it under 135. You can't go do pipeline or power line survey with it. You can use it for flight instruction in some cases, right? So the limitations that are placed on that product exist because there's no type certificate for it. So there's no formalized process it's been through to give it the design assurance that a type certificate has. And there's not a production certificate that says, well, we know what the design is and we're going to build it the same way every time. So that is why you cannot currently go use an LSA for those commercial operations. That might change. I'm hopeful that that will change. But I use it as an example because if we take the same concept and apply it to UAS that are low risk and we use what I think has been proposed as declaration of compliance to that we built this to an industry consensus standard that meets the design criteria or the level of design rigor that we all agree is enough for a low risk UAS, then it would also take a change in rules to be enable that same product without a type cert or a production cert to go work under a 135. So there's a lot of change that has to occur in the rules to enable that, but I think that's the direction we need to go. And in the interim, fill the gap with waivers and exemptions. And, and you think that this will be baked into the strategy? I'm hopeful that it will. <laughs> mm -hmm. What about NPRM targeted yeah, I th for 2024? I th What's that I about? Yeah, I think I think that's going to speak to the, this concept. I'm, again, hopeful that, that that's where this goes, enabling in-service operations of uh, across the board, not just for the smalls, but also for advanced air mobility and addressing some of the, the gaps that exist there in terms of pilot certification. You know, there's, there's a horse before the cart kind of problem with certifying for powered lift in the context of Part 61. There are just not a lot of civil certified power lift pilots out there. And without the systems to go certify them under with you know, the products to go get them training and certified with, it's a catch-22 or chicken and egg circumstance. So I think that's going to be addressed. I think much of it is going to be about about the means and ways by which the industry gets into service in the nearer term and is able to sustain in-service operations. What are some of the examples of recent examples of waivers and exemptions that you are particularly excited about? Well, there was just a, a waiver granted to Sprite just achieved yes. a, a, a linear infrastructure waiver. 
that I think makes sense. And I and I don't I don't know the details of the waiver. We didn't work that project, but I suspect that mitigations to include being quote unquote within the obstacle were part of that. And I think that's a very healthy way of doing business. There are some practicalities about uh, if you're flying along a power line, uh, high tension or high voltage power lines, that's a structure that me as a pilot, I'm not going to approach with my part 23 airplane (laughs) or part 27 airplane uh, outside of scheduled inspections. And helicopters and and manned airplane, crewed aircraft today, fixed wing aircraft do inspections over power lines. But if you're close enough to the power line that you're by nature not likely to be a conflict, then I think that should be a viable operational mitigation. Charlton, tell us about N-State Solutions, your company. You know, what it is, what's the problems you're solving? And for those customers who are going to you for airspace certification, what are their biggest frustrations? Well, so we help generally enterprise level clients navigate their way through, be it type certification, production certification, or the operational approvals to get there. So we do exemption and waiver work as well. And the reason we can do that is because we've got a very strong team of uh, what I'll refer to as stallions of folks who come from within FA or within industry that have a lot of experience in traditional aerospace operations, but they also have an ability to see a more nuanced way through the existing rules and regulations and understand how to pose the uh, questions and create the answers that come up with valid reasons for exemptions and waivers. So there's a lot of nuance that goes into emerging tech and new and novel products in a regulatory structure like the FAA has, and we just have that skill set. We're what I would describe as a as a boutique that is a wisdom firm with a lot of capacity to actually create the artifacts that are necessary to get through type certification, production certification, exemptions, and waivers. All right. So they don't give us your secrets, but let's say it's a year in. What's the most common common a customer of yours would say was the greatest value you provided them, especially in this area of frustration around certification. What's What would they say is the greatest value then state provided them? The greatest value is probably the overarching strategy and in counsel on which battles to pick and how picking this battle or that battle plays out in the chess game of how to get from beginning to end. That's honestly, that's that's probably the greatest. I mean, we've created a lot of first pass acceptance artifacts, which is a big deal. We've saved a lot of clients a lot of money by helping them create a con op that's solid or helping them create a manual that's solid or a a certification plan or a test plan. Those are all very tangible checks in the box. And the, the emerging tech industry does need that advice, counsel, and work, but where we've really made a big difference, and, and this is sort of measured in, in years or, or millions of dollars of work, is by helping clients understand if you do this, it results in that. And if you don't do this, this is how to handle getting the result you, that you want. I won't speak to the specific clients we have or, or where they are in the process, but I will say that we've had a lot of significant successes dating back to the scan eagle days through uh, Matternet, mm-hmm. and there are more successes on the horizon. Which I'll are they more le- Are your customers? That sounds great. Are that your customers more likely to be small, medium, or large vehicles? You know, we're we're kind of across the uh, spectrum because certification, by and large, has a lot of kind of overlap between all the different mm-hmm. sizes of vehicles and con ops. It's not that to certify a small is DNR is a different means of compliance, but part 21 is still part 21. So it's really, uh, from a strategy perspective, it, there's not that much difference between that and, for example, a high altitude pseudo satellite. If, if it's a fixed wing and it's, it's got a different propulsion system, then it's still a fixed wing, whether it's 55 pounds or 2,300 pounds, right? Can you generalize what your customers are most frustrated with? Well, I'll, I'll always, uh, in some cases, the cost of doing business in the regulatory world is is hard for them. And I'm not just talking about you know the cost to engage us, but the the, the members they've got to put on their staff, you know, full time employees that they probably didn't envision having engineering staff that they didn't really understand that they needed, and the timelines associated with certification are always longer than their their hopes and the fact that they can't change, they can't be as agile as their culture demands. And if they're not, if they're not working with end state, Charlton, what are they doing? How are they trying to accomplish what you provide them? Well, they're they're either trying to get it done on their own, or they're partnering with larger enterprise level existing aerospace companies like Boeing or Airbus. And what's your primary value over them? 
Well, ultimately, or historically, we cost about as much as a senior engineer to have, quote unquote, on your staff. So and unless you've got us fully managing and running your program, we offer a tremendous bang for the buck in terms of what we provide and the, the value of both the products and the strategy that comes with it. And potentially the speed to certification better, faster than what they would otherwise be doing. Yeah, it's it's uh, between the understanding the roadmap and when and where to pick battles and how to overcome some of the sticking points that are common. We just have that experience. So it lends itself to creating efficiencies where you might not otherwise see them. Where do you think it makes sense for entrepreneurs to innovate? What technologies might accelerate either the market or perhaps even help the FAA and the industry perhaps assess safety better? Well, there there is ample opportunity across many elements. I would say that Detect and avoid is still an open space that, that is going to require both hardware and regulatory work to create broad access in the U.S. And if you can get it in the U.S., you can get it elsewhere. Structures still has innovation to be applied. I think there are opportunities, huge opportunities in propulsion. And I really like where some of the companies are going that are not trying to boil the ocean with all the innovation and change. But again, are picking battles where I've got a part 23 airplane. I just want to add an innovative propulsion solution to it and pick that how, battle. How would your answer be different to Lucas' question? If you're an investor and you wanted a sizable return as possible over the next, say, three to five years, and I don't care if it's small, medium, large vehicles, what categories, don't have to mention companies, but what categories of value, what types of, of vehicles would you invest in? Uh, vehicles in the... So, for example, it could be, you know, we've had ta- we've had speakers on recently in the area of air medical delivery. Mm-hmm. Really interesting, right? Mm-hmm. Potentially really big river of cash. Not a lot of people in that space, arguably. There's a lot of value from very light payloads that can be, you know, brought to, to bear. Mm-hmm. So it could be a category or it could be, you know, specific types of vehicle that you find most interesting. Which ones would you invest in I- if you had to have a near term return? Yeah, near-term return in aerospace is always going to be a challenge. I would say that the the smalls that are that are obviously going to scale because they've got the gravitas and they've got the the clients, the enterprise level customers, those are are safer bets and probably near-term returns that are significant. I would say there's an opportunity in the tweeners that are less known that may be making entrees into linear infrastructure inspection. I still think that that is a uh, that's that's gonna we're gonna see probably a step function there over the next five years. Why? Give an example, Charlton. I'll go back to the work we did with the Scan Eagle and mm-hmm. with BNSF. I think it was a missed opportunity in many ways. I think BNSF still has a, a fairly robust drone program, and they are probably waiting for the right technology solution to grow that. So, for example, BNSF has thirty two thousand five hundred miles of track that has a, a large stack of inspection criteria. And as you witnessed just recently, we've seen um, some pretty dramatic derailments that have resulted in uh, a lot of hazards to people and property. Uh, that's an ongoing issue. It's not going away. As that infrastructure, both rail, pipeline, and our electrical infrastructure ages, it's going to require increased maintenance. It's going to require increased inspection. Mm. It's going to result in natural disasters as a result of its of its age. So I think there's a great opportunity there that's probably under the radar. Cool. And the last one would be the alternative means of propulsion. So hybrid systems, obviously electrical systems and battery technology. I, I don't have a, a finger on the pulse of where uh, hydrogen is going, but I know it's being pursued. So I think I think it's going to be interesting to see which which horses to bet on in, in propulsion. But the hybrid and the alternative to just electric, you think may be an opportunity? Absolutely, yes. And that, and and if and I say that because everything in aviation has innovation wrapped around it. We're still we're still evolving in aviation, and that's great. It's often not the step step function we want to see. Yeah. Meaning, you know, the infrastructure for all electric is is a ways out. I think. But yeah. if you can if you can get from point A to point B and and fuel up on an infrastructure that exists, and then transition to electric or vice versa, then there's definitely opportunity there. So Charlton, if you take a snapshot five years out and then another one 10 years out, what does the industry look like? I do believe that uh, BV loss among the smalls is going to be common. I think we'll see those consensus standards for- In the five-year time frame. Yeah. Yeah, I do. And in the smalls, I think that operationally and 
and from a technology perspective, once we get some proven solutions there, that uh, that will be scalable. So within five years, we'll see those those pop. I think we'll see consensus standards for both type certification and uh, for and and broader Part 91 operations occur outside of 107. So bigger platforms doing things that are more complex, more BV loss type activity. I don't know. It may or may not. That may or may not exist under 135 for the air carriers because that's a that's another layer of evolution that has to happen within the rule sets. So that may be a little bit further out. I think advanced air mobility will be introduced in some pockets or have some toeholds on the economy, which will be great. Those will be initial entrants. I think they'll be in lower risk environments. We're not going to see some of the what some of the marketing proposes as, you know, from downtown New York City to to the outskirts right away. That might be more in the 10 year time frame. Well, Will any of those companies be making money in five years? That I, I couldn't, I couldn't divine that. I, I don't know. That's a great question. That <laughs> let's talk again in in three years, and we can project. Oh, great! You want to talk in five <laughs> years and give me the answer? <laughs> right, right. Because you know, they, what, there's some quips about making money in the aerospace industry. And it's the first way to. To, to lose a bunch of money is become an, an aircraft manufacturer, right? I do think Part 121 operations uh, will be a topic of discussion within five years. Probably not fully uh, emerged or evolved, but it'll be on the radar. And I think you're going to see uh, an effort to put Part 25 aircraft under 135, high levels of autonomy in five years. So you have a, a really cool balanced perspective for this next question. So what advice would you give to someone who wants to start a business whether it be the small, medium, or large and advanced air mobility? Well, I, c companies have cultures and those cultures drive them, I think, to uh, either create a product or provide a service. I'm a pilot, right? So uh, my perspective on the aviation world is is that that guy driving the airplane around. Um, and I and I tried to grow that perspective through my interactions with our team and, and through our customer sets. But I, I think the, the talent, skills, and abilities that a given company has are going to drive it to do what they want to do. There's in in 2013 when we launched the Scan Eagle off of the ship up in the Arctic. The aviation inspector that was with us on that ship and and subsequently we had a decision whether we were going to disembark the ship and go back to shore which I was technically supposed to do or or stay on board. And he turned to me and he said, "You know, there may not be that many firsts in aviation." And this, is, this was John Siemens at the time. He was out there doing the final inspections on the system of the Blessed. And he said, there may not be that many firsts. Don't you want to be around to see this go off successfully? You've done all this work to get it here. Why don't you stay and see a first in aviation? And I turned around and got back on the boat and stayed overnight and got to see the launch the next day of the, of the first commercial BD loss operation hmm. in the US. So I bring that up because it turns out that there's still a lot of firsts. <laughs> Which right. is great, right? right. Who'd have thunk? All right, I'm going to ask you one more question, which is, you just reminded me of something. Not only are you a pilot, but you're a Harrier pilot. With Correct. all of the vertical takeoff aircraft that are being proposed today, what word of advice would you give to them, the designers, the operators, and the like, as it relates to VTOL, that as a Harrier pilot, you know that they may not know? Well, I'm very thankful that they've got as much automation baked into their transitions as they do. Right. <laughs> yeah, the Harrier was very mechanical in that way, and it was a, a blast to fly. I'm a real never bored in a Harrier, but I'm hopeful that, and and the evidence would suggest that the automation involved in in getting an air a VTOL or powered lift aircraft off the deck and into forward flight and back out of forward flight and on onto the ground via vertical flight is uh is pretty elegant. And all I'm, right, let me ask you another one then. <laughs> Let's say you look at all of the vehicles today that are flying or proposed to fly VTOL. When you look at the vehicles, when you read about them, you see the designs, what is the most common flaw you think is out there that they may be ignoring as it relates to vertical flight? Yeah, so the, the distribution of power and the ability to accept a failure within that power distribution system are, are obviously critical. You know, the military has a different level of acceptance of various risks they're very operationally driven, and that same tolerance is going to be you know, much lower in the commercial aviation space. So when I see a lot of rotors and hmm. independent systems operating with a lot of redundancy, that's great. And I want to make I, I want I wonder sometimes if the redundancy 
is as elegantly designed as it appears to be. So for investors, for example, especially a lot of these companies have gone public, you would have them drill into, you know, what's the redundancy of all of those different power systems on an aircraft? Yeah, I would ask the question of how are those, how is that system being certified? Describe to me what the hazard analysis is, or the operational risk assessment is on that power distribution system and how it gracefully handles failure. Do you think it's being properly described in the 10K in the risk section of the of the public documents? Yes, I think it probably is. And and that's part of the um, you know, the the small hole that we're trying to push all this through in the FA is that's mm-hmm. got to be captured in a rigorous way. What's the most common misunderstanding on the topic of we've talked about a lot today, but let's say certification. What's the most common misunderstanding? Well, it starts with uh a quip that uh, Kevin Hall gave me was, there's no certification by obvious. <laughs> uh, you know, and another one is a change is a change, <laughs> no matter how small. <laughs> right. Um, so, you know, it, it's again, emerging tech or, or Silicon Valley meets certification, right? And finally, what's the one point that you would want the audience to take away from our discussion today? When we question the FAA's ability to to wrap their heads around this process and get it done. Just understand that aviation has traditions. They're they're there for a reason, good reasons. The rules exist for reasons. And understanding the hazards that the rules are trying to mitigate is really uh, the first principle in working through them and, and innovating through them. That perspective alone, I think, will give any applicant, if they really embrace that, a way to navigate with the FAA in a reasonable, well-informed way. Fantastic. Well, Charlton, thank you very much for uh, your patience and for your time. Uh, We really enjoyed the conversation and uh, look forward to having you back at some point. Maybe talk about the Harrier. Right. Well, we'll (laughs) visit in five years and I'll tell you (laughs) what happened. Right. Exactly. (laughs) It's my plan. Sounds great. (laughs) Thanks, Charlton. All right, guys. Thanks so much. All right, that's a wrap for today. Thank you for listening to the Vertical Space Podcast. Reach out if there are topics that you would like us to discuss and goodbye until the next episode. Unless mentioned, this podcast is in no way endorsing or promoting any person and or company mentioned and all opinions within the podcast are solely that of the presenters. The Vertical Space makes no guarantees, warranty or representation of any information given in this podcast. Any information given is for informational purposes and should be used at your own risk. This podcast is for general educational and entertainment purposes only.